Welcome back to my channel. I'm Satnam B. Today we're going to be looking at After Effects. I'll be showing some tips and tricks which I find most useful in my general workflow and some techniques and tricks which I wish I knew when I first started out in After Effects. The first thing we're going to be looking at today is what a null object is and how it can be used. So a null object is essentially an invisible layer which can be used to create a super parent. Essentially what this means is you can have multiple layers connected to one object that is completely invisible. You can use this to create things that are scaling, spinning, or be used to actually position things. I find this very useful when trying to set up compositions which might need to be flipped or need to have a specific central point. This way you're able to move things around as an entire composition without having to manually keyframe every single thing within your scene. For this sequence, what I've done is created a series of circles which can be parented to one singular null and you can see it can be centrally rotated from a single point rather than having to manually move all the anchor points and rotate individually. The next technique we're going to look at is creating nulls from paths. This is an inbuilt script within After Effects which allows you to interact with paths using nulls. So there's three parts of this one script. The first is points from nulls, which effectively allows you to control the path itself using nulls. Each null is essentially a controller for the individual point. The second is nulls to follow points. This is similar to the first one. What it does is it allows you to use the path itself to generate movement, which the nulls actually follow. This is great for adding objects that need to follow a specific point on your path. Lastly, we have trace paths. This is a function that allows you to trace the path from A to B and allows you to create a null which follows the specific path. This can be used to attach arrowheads to a path and have them follow the actual path itself. So starting with points to follow nulls. So for this sequence, all we're going to do is create a path which we're going to apply this script on and see how the nulls actually are formed. So as you see, it creates an additional three nulls, one for each of the three points, and they can be controlled individually or we can merge them all and parent them to a specific null and control the entire path together. These nulls can be edited in terms of scale, rotation, uh, but as we're using a path, the best thing is using it for expressions. So you can add a wiggle function and it will start wiggling the path itself from whichever point you need it to move from. The next one we're going to look at is the trace paths. The reason why is it's slightly different, but can be used to show some really cool, interesting animations. Uh, so first thing we're going to do is just quickly add in a path, which is just a straight line from two points and add a quick trim paths, which is a way of animating a build up from A to B. We then click the path and add a trace paths to it. And now it creates a null, which has the trace path effect on it. It automatically creates two keyframes, one on zero and one on two seconds in. The effect works by using a percentage to move the null from point A to point B. You're able to parent different objects to the null and it will follow the same transformation sequence. So for instance, with this, we're just gonna quickly add a circle and we can add a build up and we can see the, the null being used to move the object. So this can be used to add arrowheads or it can be used for a number of things when creating motion graphic sequences. You can still use the main animation techniques like motion blurring or the graph editor or things like that. For the final part of this technique, we're going to look at how nulls can be used to follow the paths themselves. For this demonstration, what I'm going to do is create a quick circle, which will be converted to a Bezier path. This will allow us to get four points on the path, which will help drive the effect. So once you've converted your shape into a Bezier path, what we need to do is then create the nulls to follow points. If you go to the shape layer, you can see there's a null on each point. Um, if you try and move these, these don't actually move. Uh, as you can see in their position, they've been locked in using the expression. And when you try to add a path modifier, like a wiggle, it doesn't actually do anything to the nulls themselves as they're still taking the path data. When you try to move the path itself, you will see the effect start working. So all you got to do is just click the little stopwatch next to the path and this will allow us to actually start creating a simple animation, moving points from one position to another. So if we stretch out the horizontal positions, we can create something kind of funky just for the sake of this quick demonstration. Now that the path has three keyframes set up, uh, we can see the positions of the nulls actually start moving. 
So where this comes in handy is when you draw a different object, which can be parented to the nulls, um, and you can start seeing things start to change. So let's just set this in a different color just so it makes it easier. So if we parent this circle to the top shape, as the path starts moving, the circle itself begins to move as well, but it's still keeping to that one central null object. The next technique is more about the UI and how to make your After Effects run a bit smoother on your machine. So if you're working with quite a heavy sequence, trying to load in a bunch of assets can be quite heavy on your computer. Uh, what you can do is use different qualities of playback, which allows you to see things slightly more blurrier and a bit more pixelated, but it means that your animations can run faster. You can also turn on adaptive viewing this is a function which allows After Effects to process your visuals at a lower resolution, which can be set up so that you reach as a minimum threshold. This means that you can process uh, movements within your composition a lot faster, and it means that playback lag will be reduced. You can change the settings and the preferences and mean that you can change the value that you reach. So for instance, if you prefer working to a half resolution or a quarter, this can be adjusted. The next technique is actually a really simple one. So using the color picker tool, you can pretty much select a color from what's on the canvas. So for instance, if you want to choose the background color on an image or say even parts of the UI, you can use the eyedropper and select on things. But if you're using say a double monitor setup or you can tab into a different software, you can actually source colors directly from another thing. So for instance, on this, I just sourced it from a random image on Pexels. The great thing about this is it allows you to work with colors directly from, say, a brand guideline document or an image that might not be embedded into your After Effects project. The next thing we're looking at is actually using templates within your document. So, for instance, the way I like to work is quite organized. So I like to have things set up as four definitive folders, one for my main comps, one for my pre comps, one for my graphics and one for my footage. So instead of manually creating this every time I use After Effects, what I've done is create a simple template which can be added into uh, the template preferences box. To set up a template, all you have to do is build the folders you need in an After Effects file, save it to a location, then add it to the preferences. And it means that every time you open up an After Effects project, these folders will be set up. And it means that you can have things that are set up in a way that you can always use them for different projects. So for instance, if you always need to have a logo present or a specific image set, it will be ready to go. The next technique we're looking at is called trim paths. So this is a shape attribute which can be applied in the add menu on any shape layer within After Effects. So this is quite a cool trick which can help you to sequence build up animations. This can be used to animate a start, end and offset of a path. Where you are actually building up a path, this is pretty limitless and allows you to basically sequence anything. You could use it for creating callouts, making routes on a map or even simple things like building out reveals. The three parameters, start, end, and offset, can be keyframed, which means that you can play with the speed editor and create really custom animations that match the sort of speed and intensity. So more severe easing will mean a fast animation. The cool thing about this attribute is it means it can be applied to one shape layer, but have multiple paths. So the more paths you have, they can all be controlled by the single animation. So for instance, if you're playing with the build up, you can have several paths being built up collectively or they can be built up one after the other. This is something to always play around with when you're building different animations. One thing to pay attention to is the order of stacking of the attributes within your single shape layer. If you have attributes which modify the actual path itself, you'd want those to be present before the trim paths. If the trim paths is before, it can result in the original path being manipulated rather than the actual attributes themselves. The next thing we're going to look at is how the speed editor can allow you to create really interesting animations just by playing with the way the Bezier affects the easing of a shape. So the typical easy easing is pretty much a slow beginning and a slow stop. So the idea is you want to try and create something that works for the direction of animations. So if you want something to be a bit more, say, rapid from the get go, you would need it to have a more of a steeper arch at the beginning and you would need it a bit more gradual if it was something that's more of a slower build up. So what I'm doing here is just creating a few different circles, which I have the same A and B point, just so that we can compare different animation styles. The first one uses the basic linear animation easing, which is pretty much just a straight to and from. So there's no increase or decrease of speed. 
The second one will have uh, the basic easy easing and we'll have one that will have more extreme easy easing. And then lastly, we'll have one that has toggled hold frames. So the benefit of using all of these is you can really see how animation keyframes can really affect um, the single animation. Depending on what you're actually creating, you would need to play with different speed settings to create a desired look. So more controlled speed graph editing will allow you to create more succinct and more flowing animations, whereas more linear based animations, they can look a bit flat if there's too many linear moving parts. But again, this is something you need to play with. The cool thing about using the speed editor is it allows you to really change how an animation takes place. So for instance, on this point where we're customizing the arch, uh, we're making the first arch be quite severe. Um, meaning that the speed will just kick in straight away. Whereas on the second part, we're making the speed be more gradual and it has that more slowing calmer effect. Lastly, by using hold frames, what this essentially does is just creates two definitive points from point A to point B, meaning that there's no in-betweening between the frames. This is great for using something that needs to have a more binary approach like on off. This could be used for like a blinking light or something that needs to just have straight on off values. If you are new to After Effects, I would highly recommend playing with a speed editor just to try and work out how different speeds can really affect your animations. It's also great practice to try and create things that match real physics, like for instance, a bowling ball versus a feather hitting the floor and try to simulate gravity. Mastering a speed editor can take a little bit of time, but it definitely will pay off when you create really nice flowing animations. When working on motion graphics projects, sequencing layers is always quite common, but sequencing by hand can be quite time consuming, especially if you have to offset by a certain amount. Within After Effects, there's a nifty little trick called sequence layers. So if you select all your layers and right click, you can select keyframe assistance and select sequence layers. You'll be greeted with a dialog box, which allows you to choose how much you want to offset the layer by. The way it works is using the duration of your layers and working out how much overlap you need. Where I'm working with three second layers and I want to have an offset of two frames, I would need to make sure that the value becomes two seconds, 28 frames. This way that when you press enter, it will take a two frame gap between each layer. For this sequence, I'm using a simple animation. I'm just going with an A to B to A approach, which will just take my object from one point to another and then back. When using sequence layers, it will move your entire layer. So it could mean that the start position will need to be adjusted. So you might have to extend the duration of your comp or extend the duration of your individual layer. When sequencing layers, it's always a good idea to try a few different values to see how the different overlaps work. Having less gaps between the different sequences can result in a more faster, almost wave-like animation, whereas more space can result in a more almost echo-like effect. So again, it's always good to just play about and see how different offsets work for your specific project. For the next tip, I'm showing how to export single frames from your After Effects composition. This is actually a really simple process. All you have to do is choose the frame you want on the timeline, go to composition, choose save frame as, and then you are given three options. So you can either choose to save it as a PSD, which is a Photoshop file that will contain all the layers, or you can choose to save it as a general file this will give you the option to save it as a PNG or a JPEG in the render queue. So from here, you, all you've got to do is just change the settings in your render queue, then just click render to get your static frame. You can use the shortcut Control Alt S to export frames really quickly. This is a very good technique to export still frames for maybe a style guide or a storyboard. For the final tip of this list, I thought it would be a good idea to look at how masks and different blend modes can really affect your project. Masks are a must have tool within After Effects. They allow you to cut out and combine different areas on a asset. They work on all sorts of assets within After Effects, including videos, pictures, and even shape layers and text layers. When you draw a new mask, you get a new field on your layer called mask, and this will give you options to change the path itself. So for instance, changing it from a square to maybe an ellipse and using a custom size, or feathering the actual effect. You can also draw out a mask using a pen tool, which will give you more precise points when trying to mask out a specific object. From here, you can also apply different feathering, which will sort of give you a softer edge. And then you can also use the mask opacity and mask expansion to control how a mask looks. So you can use a mask on different objects, including shapes. So the great thing about this is when you draw a mask, it's on its own separate bounding box, meaning you can move this mask around as opposed to actually interacting with the position of the shape. 
when using a mask, the expansion element allows you to expand a mask to reach the maximum area of the layer that you're working on. So for instance, with this square, when we have this circle mask in the center, when we use the expansion, it pretty much matches the entire outside area of the square. So this is quite a cool way of building different transitions between scenes, as you can really mask out and choose a specific point. Another interesting part of masks is how you can use them as part of compositing to apply different effects to specific regions. For instance, using a fill effect, it allows you to add in a block color to a specific area or a shape. So when you apply a mask, what you can do is add in a composited reference point inside the effect, which only chooses the mask as its sort of base. This is good as it allows you to create a series of different colors within one shape layer without having to add different fills or different paths. The cool thing is you can have multiple effects being referenced to a series of masks or all to the same one. This will allow you to create really in-depth visuals without having to create a series of stacked layers. And the good thing is where they are masked, it means that you could actually animate the masks individually. While on the subject of masks, you can also use different blending modes specifically the alpha blending modes to interact with how objects are viewed in a composition. Different alpha blend modes will allow you to mask in or mask out different areas and it will stack upon the entire composition. So for this example, what I'm doing is using a series of videos which will be masked out in the center by a shape layer set to stencil alpha. So as you can see, now that we've applied that blend mode, it only takes whatever's underneath and it basically masks out all the composition to meet the shape itself. Different blending modes will give you different approaches. So for instance, the stencil and silhouette blend modes lets you use a single layer's alpha channel or luma values to isolate specific regions of the background. This is a great way of actually sort of masking out entire compositions or choosing a specific area that needs to be blocked out. I use this quite frequently when I'm creating things like callouts or templated assets, which need to be used to block out certain parts of videos. I would suggest messing about with some of these masks and some of these blend settings and seeing what you can create. Hopefully you found some of these tips and tricks useful. If you did, please like and subscribe. It really helps the channel grow. Thanks.